Hey everybody, it's Randy with Direct Action Combat Performance. This is Operator Reacts. Okay, we're looking at an operator. What do we do first? Actually, it's kind of hot. He's got a red shirt on. It's ready for Canada. This is definitely going to be awesome Canada build. Identity. What are we going to name our guy? Very important question of the day. So we're just going to name him Ike. <laughs> it just makes sense. I had to do something. I'm trying to make it fucking entertaining, okay? Call sign. JTF. Can I do the two? I can't. All right. We'll just do JTF. We're getting the two part, but you know, <laughs> it's fine. What is a Canadian appearance? You know what? We'll do male. Fu no, I feel like it's. Up. We never use male five for anybody. Okay. I don't want to do this no more. So male two for Ike, the Canadian JTF2 operator. Let's go. Facial hair, none. Why? Because in Canada, bro, they don't do the whole facial hair thing as much as we do, I think. I don't know what it is with guys. Like, they feel like they need a beard and they look like a, need to look like a complete bum to be, uh, you know, appearance of a soft soldier. Listen, the level of professionalism and the fact that one keeps his face clean and looks professional to me um, holds more weight than somebody who looks like they've been living at a, out of a dumpster, um, you know, in, in your local city um, as, as some sort of bum. So, you know, the, you know, this this stigma with, you know, you're a soft operator, you got to have hair down to your, your neck or your shoulders and a beard down to your chest. No, um, that has nothing to do with your ability to do your job. Now for gloves, we're going to go, with, you know, let's do assault gloves. Oh my God, bro. Jesus Christ. Choke me with those daddy mommy gloves, bro. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do, we'll do khaki. We'll do khaki gloves for him. Cause he got the hot knuckles on there. So he can punch you in the fuck. Now, you know what? These are cool guys. So we're going to give them a schmagma. Let's do it. <laughs> Dang, he already looking so delicious. Oh my fucking. Some pieces are accurate. Some pieces are inaccurate. The plate carrier. If I'm being honest, all the tier one operators are either gonna rock like micro chest rigs or you're gonna rock the cry JPC. So we're gonna go super slick with these guys because we're gonna put a lot of stuff on our battle belt. So we're gonna use the cry JPC. So he's accurate here. Um, the cry precision JPC is uh, the carrier of choice by by most guys that I've worked with in the past. And uh, you know whether it's a tier tactical or cry precision JPC, the idea is to be as streamlined as you possibly can. The reality is the more pouches you put on your, your carrier, the more shit that you probably don't need in those pouches. So more streamlined, um, more mobility focused, being able to you know jump over things, climb through things. So streamlined carrier is, is accurate. So he's, he's, he's on point here. Oh, Boy, look at him. JTF2 going in on your bitch, bro. Hajo God damn. So the Canadian military and the JTF have been known to use the M17, also known as the P320. This hook right here. So we're going to pick the M17, then we're going to build it out. So let's go ahead and put a tack light on it. Then we're going to put a Dr. 2 flat on there. Ooh, bro. She looking real nice, baby. We are not going to put a suppressor on it, and we'll do a 20 round magazine. Why? Because bullets are fuck. Up. Yeah, accurate. So it would not be uncommon for guys to run a 20 round magazine, um, tack light fixed to the pistol common and the transition is, if not completed, it soon will be from iron sights to red dot, red dot uh, optic. Um, some guys prefer just iron sights. Um, and as a, a backup combat gun, their thought process is, you know, if the red dot is to fail, you know, they're already accustomed and comfortable with the iron sights. So they'll keep the, the iron sights as is. And that's, that's operator preference. So most guys have switched to the red dot and what you'll see is, you know, the, the acquisition of that target is a lot quicker with a red dot. That being said, some guys have, uh, maintained iron sights and, and that's just the way they'll, they'll roll. Primary weapon system is five four three two nine ten one zero. I don't really know if I'm being honest with you. <laughs> so if you guys remember our SAS operator build about Chris Craighead, who's a fucking savage, their primary weapon systems were stuff like the C7, the CA, and all these different variant weapon systems, right? It's actually the same thing with JTF2. And I do have an interesting build off of the primary weapon systems for some of the direct action stuff that they are using. But what we're going to use is the HK416 CQB. Now, how will this build be different, might you ask? Let me show you. We're going to put the PEC-15 on the top of the weapon system. Then right next to it, we're going to put a EOTech EXPS 3.0 in FDE. Kind of similar to some of the other builds, right? This is where it changes up just a little bit. And some of y'all are going to be like, hey, what the... So I was looking at some of the JTF2 range videos, and I definitely noticed a lot of them were rocking angled foregrips. So we're going to rock a FDE angled grip. Ooh, bro, look at this. 
So with with this piece, this is very operator preference. Some guys like an angle foregrip, some guys like a vertical foregrip, and some guys just like a hand stop or nothing at all. And that's personal preference based on whether or not they adopt a C clamp grip or whether or not they like having something supportive in their uh, in their support hand. Uh, me personally, when I was operating, I, I liked the vertical foregrip and I still still utilize it. And the reason that I utilize that is not just for support with the support end when I'm running the carbine, but also from a combative perspective. I like having that extra piece at the fore end of the uh, upper receiver to jam into somebody's throat or temple if, uh, if a, a ballistic response wasn't the requirement, but I could still beat the snot out of somebody with that gun. I like having that added piece of the vertical foregrip. God dang! And then next we have a suppressor, but guess what? Not a whole lot of them are using suppressors, which kind of threw me for a loop. Now, no, I'm not saying they never use suppressors, but just off of some of the footage that I saw, I was like, you know what? No suppressor. This is what's going to blow your mind. On some of the footage that I saw, they were using regular metal stand mags. Oh! What the f*** is that sh you know what? I don't make the rules, but this is what they did, and they're a tier one unit. So basically, you put anything in their hands, it's a weapon. Yeah, so... They're talking about the metal mags versus like a, a mag pole uh, window uh, polymer mag. Um, you know, you'll see a variation, but for the most part, guys are, are running a polymer magazine. So mag pole or hex mag or something of that nature, something typically with a window on the side. Um, so they have a good indicator of how many rounds they have that magazine. It's not uncommon that you'll see metal magazines more common to see uh, like a mag pole window mag. So that, that's funny. And suppressors like, you know, Using the suppressor during training, using the suppressor during operations, every operation that I've conducted, we had a suppressor on the gun. In training, I would say 50% of the time we would use it, 50% of the time we wouldn't. And the only reason for that is, I mean, the suppressors and the charging handle, the seal of the charging handle has improved over, over the years. But the reason that we wouldn't is because of the blowback. So when you're training with a suppressor, the blowback and all of that, uh, you know, negative shit that the, the operator would be inhaling is minimal when you have the suppressor off. So when the suppressor's on, all of that shit you, you tend to breathe in. Now, being you know that being said, improvements have been made with the seal around the charging handle and the seal um, and, and the vented uh, the fluted vented uh, system of the of the suppressors. So you'll probably see that a lot more often now, where guys are, are using suppressors because it is a little bit better uh, from a health perspective. But typically during uh, during training, we would, we might have used the suppressors 50% of the time. Operations 100% of the time. Um, I'd say some of it is accurate, some of it is inaccurate. Like, yeah, the guys are at, at uh, JTF2 are transitioning. If not, they're probably already completed the P320. So the six hour P320 has replaced the six hour P226. Um, that's accurate. Yeah, the guys are wearing uh, multi-cam, that is accurate. Um, the Canine Armed Forces, they use CADPAT. The Special Forces, they use multi-cam, and that's to differentiate between the two. And also, it has a lot to do with working with our allies. So all of the uh, the, the Tier 1 organizations, they all operate in, uh, in multi-cam for the most part. Um, so it's just to to interact with uh, our allies. So that's, that's, that's accurate. But yeah. Um, you know, it's not inaccurate with the, with the load out, the, what he's using here as an example is the, um, HK 416. It's a great platform, but we don't use that. Um, we use a, a, a Colt Canada or, uh, MRR and there's variations to that platform. So guys will, you know, put certain furniture on it that's applicable for how they want to operate. And obviously there is um, a few variations that are offered to them, but that's very personal choice, whether it's a, an Aimpoint or an EOTech, that's operator preference.